Uh, uh, afternoon, everyone. So, uh, what I want to talk to you about is uh, Farm Drop, uh, how the business works, and the principles behind it as well. Um, I'll try and race through, and then perhaps if you've got any questions, please, please just ask away. So, um, so to start with, I just wanted to look at the problems that the business addresses. So. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the agricultural system we have at the moment is unsustainable, which I'm sure you're all very well aware of. Um, so there's been a number of scandals recently about food fraud, um, the horse meat scandal, um, also um, slavery in the supply chain, lots of shocking stories about how our food is actually produced. Plus, there is a, an ever-growing health crisis um, food-related illnesses are the single biggest cost to the NHS, and, uh, and we won't even go into the, the damage being done to the environment. But an interesting thing for us as a business is that farmers at the moment are only receiving, on average, 7% of the shelf price of the produce that they sell. So I um, just wanted to look at some other things that are going on out there as well. So one is that other trends that are affecting our world. One is that online sales continue to rise uh, at a huge rate. So at the moment, um, I'm not sure what sales are exactly, but it's around about seven billion online grocery sales. And that's set by 2019, the IGD just came up with their, their latest revision on the forecast, <coughs> which is forever going up at a quicker rate of 17 billion by 2019. Um, also, interestingly, 80% of users of households have used Click and Collect at some point. So Click and Collect as a format, the, the problem that a number of uh, companies are experiencing in the cost of last mile delivery is, is a real problem. But interestingly, consumers are onto this and they're, they're interested in Click and Collect, which is buying stuff online and then pitching out <coughs> somewhere nearby near to their home to, to pick up whatever it is, the shirt or food, whatever it is they've bought. The good news for us as well is that there's um, growing interest in buying loads of food for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into now, but over the Plunkett uh, group have a, oh no, sorry, this is from DEFRA actually, have a stat that over 70% of us want more local food. Plunkett group stat, slightly um, less uh, depressing, although, you know, this is the opportunity here, is that at the moment only 1% of food sold is sourced locally. So, so there's, a big, there's a big opportunity there between that 70% and that 1%. So I think um, I was just talking in the lunch break uh, about how a business like ours sets our stall out and ultimately what our goal is. So at the moment we're a very small business, we have a lot of ambition. But for us, it's a business with a social purpose. It's all about helping create and grow sustainable local food systems. So that's, it's both about a belief in local control and a belief in the need for a more sustainable food system. So very quickly, this is how it works. So before, before anything starts, before a carrot is bought, um, Someone approaches us and says, I'd like to start a farm drop in South Kensington. So we ask them a few questions just to check they're the right person. And then once we're happy that they've got the right skills and they're really networked in that community, we set them three tasks. One is to find a venue. The other is to find a group of members, and that'll vary depending on where they are. And the third thing is to find a group of producers <coughs> as well. So you're trying to find the buyers and sellers. It's about building a critical mass so that you can have uh, a regular exchange. So once, that's, um, once that, that critical mass is in place, then this is how Farm Drop works. Members order online, so they place their orders on their computer or their tablet or whatever. And then once a week, there's a cut-off, there's a cut-off day. Uh, so uh, there's one uh, last night for our farm drop in Worthing. So at midnight, the orders have to go in, and then on the stroke of midnight, the orders get emailed to the producers. So the producers get a little readout um, of everything that they've sold. Um, they also get a little label for each customer <coughs> order. So, so what we're trying to do is to make 
the process at their end really efficient. But that's, so that's how it works. And then everyone comes to the venue once a week and producers bring their food and in a two hour window, producers bring their food and the members pitch up and pick up their food. So at all stages you're trying to, you're trying to make it efficient for producers because the time that they take away from the fields, bakeries, boats, etc., is is time that, that costs them. So we're trying to maintain a social link, both via the website and via the, these weekly pickups, but we're also very mindful that time costs money for everyone involved. So um, the, the, this is the revenue model. So the way, the way it works is that producers, and remember the, the average at the moment is 7%, they receive 80% in the farm drop model. Uh, keepers, who are those local organisers, they receive 10% and farm drop receive 8% and there's 2% for transactions. So the idea there is that you have um, a local who is motivated to both organise and develop a market locally. So they're trying to, they, they need, in our view, they need to be incentivised to, to, to build ongoing interest in this market. So I've worked quite a lot on sustainability and for us, it was really important that we had um, a business model that wasn't dependent on funding and you know, a, a possible change in funding regime, etc. Et we needed to find a model that worked and funded our business, but also was able not to rely on volunteers, but funded people locally. And what we hope is a sustainable rate and still makes a very favourable deal for producers, but, it was, but it's very important that the keepers get a, get a fair return for their investment of time. So I guess this is about how digital technologies can change the food system. Um, good. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a book that I, I'm particularly <coughs> inspiring that's about the sharing economy and the collaborative consumption. Uh, it's a book written by a lady called Rachel Botsman and it's called What's Mine Is Yours. And this is quite a, the sharing economy, um, as many of you will know, is, is quite difficult to find. It means many things to many different people. The one line I particularly like of hers is the idea of um, building trust between strangers. So the simple, the simple thing here is that the internet enables people with a common interest to find each other and combine their power. So, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to find people that you have a, a shared interest with. The internet's really efficient at pulling, pulling you together and, and aggregating your your combined will and power. So I wanted to go through a few examples of, of how that sort of principle applies to our business, how it informs our business model. So one is, um, very basically, these, these are different points, but they, they, they interrelate. One is co-buying, so it's the idea that you're, you're aggregating enough demand as a group of neighbours, in our case, to make it worthwhile for a, a farmer to come to you to deliver some carrots. So if you live in London, you've got to deliver, you've got to deliver a few more than if you're you know, in Sirencester and the farmer's only two miles away. The other thing, and they are related, is that you're, you're cutting out the middleman. So uh, businesses like, I think Etsy is a great example for us, <coughs> they're able to <coughs> invest more in higher production standards and give something to the customer at a lower price. So they get a better return. So if they're, selling, if they're selling in a boutique on the high street, a beautiful sort of uh, handmade bowl or something, if you're selling it on the high street, you've got to pay for the rent, the rates, the staffing. It's not a very efficient route to market. And as a result, you, you, you get a, quite a low rate. You, you sell it as a, at a wholesale rate. And it's very expensive when it's, when it's sold through that shop. So we, what we want to do is look at how cutting out the middleman aids higher product or enables higher production standards, makes them, makes them uh, viable. So this is the idea, yes, yeah, so co buy and cutting out the middleman. This, this guy suddenly joined by all his friends and the farmer's happy to deliver his carrots direct. 
So I can probably wash over this a bit, but I guess the this is how supermarkets work. They have um, they have um, suppliers coming from a long way away. It's about finding the cheapest over the time, so manipulating the market to find the cheapest range, and they'll source from a long way away to get what what they think the customer wants at the expense of the local producer. So this guy might be bang his door, but he can't get into this supply chain because he's not big enough, because he doesn't want to, um, for, a variety of, for a variety of reasons. So this is how we'd all like to shop, um, just driving around farms and picking up beautiful produce and bringing it back home. But obviously that doesn't work. So this is, this is what we do, basically. We have producers nearby, but then when you find other people, like-minded people, which you can bring together and combine your, your buying power, then it makes sense for, for that producer and all these other producers to, once a week, come and bring all their food to a central point. So this is, yeah, so it's a much more efficient model. There's no waste as well. Um, I'll come on to a bit more of that. So this um, is the point I was making about Etsy and this principle of disintermediation uh, and this is one example of a, one product that a farmer in Sussex was selling uh, a couple of years back so he he had he showed us a butternut squash that he was growing and he said that he was selling it to um, Whole Foods and um, in uh, Whole Foods it was it cost three pounds <coughs> forty and he was saying he was going to get him one pound for that uh, butternut squash. But he said, with farm drop, I can, I can get one pound 52, and I can sell it to the customer for one pound 82. So the shopper's making a one pound 58 saving. So that's, I mean, it's one example, and we've worked up a, a number of others recently um, with the drops we're running at the moment. But the basic principle there holds good across most products. If you, can, if you can sell it direct and take out those costs uh, in more expensive routes to market, then you're able to um, sell uh, you know, a product that's often uh, higher quality at a lower price. So another way that we use the internet um, and the principles of the sharing economy is this idea of uh, sharing idle assets. <coughs> so uh, at the moment, you can, there are all sorts of new businesses emerging. One that I particularly like is sharemydoggy.com. So or it might be .co.uk, but it means that a dog is no longer for life um, and can just be for Christmas or <coughs> weekend. Uh, and, and it works really well. You just you, you find neighbours nearby. They know a bit about you. They can see your Facebook profile, um, uh, and and it, when they can go away sometimes and, and have someone else walk their dog. Uh, another really good example in food and farming world is Landshare, which is a project I'm sure many of you are aware of, which is a great idea. Just basically matchmaking between um, ground fields, allotment patches, back gardens that would otherwise not be not be used, and people who are willing to to work them and, and you know, get a few vegetables to pop up out of the ground. The way we use this principle is in the venues that we host the farm drops at. So for this pub in Walthamstow, they're only too happy, that's where I was last night, they're only too happy to host a farm drop because for them it means they've just got another 30 people coming in through their door once a week buying food. They've also talked about buying the food themselves as well. It just means they're more, it puts them <coughs> at the heart of the community. It's a positive social project. So pubs are very interested for commercial reasons. We've also found that um, some uh, libraries and other sort of public institutions are interested as well. So for them, it helps them hit some of their KPIs as well. They need to be part of the community <coughs> and prove their value. <coughs> so there's no shortage of places that are willing to, to provide uh, space for free. Um, so crowdsourcing. So this is a really this is a really interesting topic. So the best example of crowdsourcing is, is Wikipedia, arguably. Um, there's a brilliant uh, 
weekly chat, a hashtag chat on Twitter called AgriChat, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, um, which we were involved in uh, last week. And they have reached, I think sometimes there's about a million people per week. Uh, obviously lots of farmers, they love using social media, it's a great way for them to connect and share thoughts, it's a really efficient way to, to uh, disseminate learnings and you know, things like just what's going on with the weather, that sort, of, that sort of thing. The big thing I think in food and farming um, is, is data and how data is used. So I guess um, one way you could look at the one cru crucial moment in the evolution of supermarkets was when they realised that they could, they started to move beyond the brands because they started to own that information at, at the retail. <coughs> at, at, at retail. So it was, you know, Unilever were dominant in all, companies like Unilever were dominant in all partnerships with their retailers. But the thing that changed was that the supermarkets, Tesco with their Dunhumby, I think that's the right name, database started to aggregate all of these uh, consumer, um, consumer tastes and, um, and started, to get a, started to own the customer really and own what the customer wanted. For us, it's all about the platform <coughs> providing all of the information, everything that takes place in the platform freely to all the participants. <coughs> so as a, as a customer and as a producer, you'll be able to see what your next door farm drop uh, is pricing at. So if their, if their cost, you know, if their, their beef is twice, twice the price, then you'll be able to see that. So this is all about, we, we are the conduit, we are, we are the platform. This is about enabling participants on the platform to trade more efficiently. And it's also about enabling smaller retailers to access the skills and knowledge that previously would have only been pulled together in a, in a large corporate organisation. So that's, um, that's, that's a, a really core part of our model and what we think builds um, you know, strategically resilience in what we're doing. That's what will keep people coming to us and engaging with us. We just, we, we're a pool of knowledge from which people can freely draw the whole time. I guess another really interesting uh, development is the way in which people are aggregating their combined political clout. Organisations like 38 Degrees demonstrate this really well. Um, we've seen um, how in a number of different communities they've pulled together, often using social media, to uh, campaign against developments that they don't like. Uh, this is a picture of um, town uh, near where my parents live called Sherbourne and uh, they campaigned very successfully for Tesco's not to not not to uh, be able to develop the local hotel and and, and Waitrose got a successful application <laughs> a couple of weeks later but anyway they got what they wanted um, and that's the main thing so and I, and I hope that what we hope as well and we we'll see it a very tiny bit is that will help to aggregate the smaller voices. So this is all about uh, kind of helping, helping the smaller guy. So no, another aspect here um, of how uh, technology is, is enabling the sort of food system that we're talking about, and other smaller scale uh, businesses is crowdfunding. Um, and it's evolving at such a rapid rate. It's quite scary. Uh, it is becoming more mainstream. Um, but this is one crowdfunding platform called Crowdcube. But actually, interestingly, I mean, it's not a new concept to farming. And many of you will have heard of a business called Fordal uh, Community uh, Farm. And I think this is from about 12 years ago. So they described themselves as one farmer, 8,000 landlords. So they were, I heard a, a talk from uh, the lady. Um, who, who, who farms there and whose parents own the farm. And it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, but they, they just realised that they were, they were going to be forced out of business. So they, they thought, well, we love the land and we love what we're doing and it's important that we remain an organic farm. So let's invite the community to, to own this because this is, that's all we're interested in, really, is 
is having an ongoing place in the community. And this was really before the notion of crowdfunding existed. But they did it. They got some amazing press. And, and, and the, community, the community are their supporters, their workers, their buyers, uh, and their best friends. We also are going to be crowdfunding. And for us, that's an important principle for the business because it, it enables the participants to have ownership in the platform and to have a say in how it's governed as well. So that's, uh, that's a very important thing for us. Um, so one quote that, um, <coughs> one book, that, another book that I'm sure many of you are aware of is um, Small is Beautiful. And, and one slightly cheesy thing that we keep saying at the moment is Small is Beautiful but, and Now Better. And I, and I think that's, the, that's the, the guiding thought here is that what technology does, or one of the many things that technology does in the context of local food systems is it, it, it enables smaller players to be much more efficient, more convenient, more professional, more sustainable, and ultimately more profitable as well. Um, so that is, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>